The Theory of Light by Sophia and Lovell. Plot Summary, Part 4. Book 2, Epistemology, which is the theory of knowledge and understanding. This chapter focuses on Jeannie. She recalls the sunflowers at Beaufort while she watches her blood spread across the mattress. She's alone and starts dreaming about a boy she went to school with, who pretends to shoot her. She sees herself in brown car with Penelope and Specs, her dolls. Watching her parents fly away on a silver pair of wings, she sees the soldiers driving into Beaufort and hears the gunshots. She sees them stopping at the sunflowers. Now she begins to wonder if she is dreaming or just remembering her past. Jeannie prepares Vida's clothes for her funeral and finds it amusing that in her final moments she is concerned with being domestic. She wonders if after a lifetime of being in flight and believing that she was spectacular, that she was actually a hybrid thing, both being rooted but also free to fly. She has reached for something and touched it, and it was satisfactory enough for her. Now she sees herself with Marcus in the sunflowers. She is remembering the time her father returned. She runs to him before her mother joins them, leaving Marcus behind. The sunflowers turn towards them. She knows that the future has arrived. And Vida also finally arrives home. He finds all the house lights off, making him think that Jeannie is not home. He finds two empty glasses with cut lemon wedges in the kitchen, and this makes him suspicious. He then sees Jeannie sleeping upstairs in a pool of her blood. He takes her to Marta Day Hospital, where Dr. Mombo tells him to go home. At home, he initially does not want to wash Jeannie's blood off of his clothes. He sits in the kitchen at the table until the early hours of the morning, when he remembers that Jeannie has set out clothes for him and packed her suitcase. The suitcase is filled with her childhood clothes, Penelope and Specs, and blue silk slippers. This is significant, as this represents her independence. But she also added blue slippers, which is interesting. He realises she has prepared herself and him for her to leave. The fact that she took time to leave clues, such as the cut wedges and his clothes being laid out. She is choosing her own ending, and he feels that this is a sense of betrayal. He goes to shower and wash her blood off, and notices a pair of sunglasses which belong to neither him nor Jeannie in the bathroom. He wears the clothes Jeannie prepared for him to wear to her funeral, and tucks the sunglasses in his pocket before leaving the house. Vida has now been back on the street for three days. He is dreaming about the first time him and Jeannie kissed. When he wakes up, he finds a colourful bird on his chest, but before he can touch it, he is interrupted by a newspaper being thrown at him. He reads the article, Jesus back on the streets, and is offended by some of the claims, so he decides to confront the journalist who wrote it, Becky Timber. Becky Timber says he cannot print the truth despite the fact that he knows the truth, because sensationalism is what sells the paper. He tells Vida he wrote the article about Golide and feels guilt for what happened at Beaufort. In return, Vida tells him how Golide spared his life. Vida goes to Dingani's office to tell him Jeannie is in a coma. At first he feels pity for Dingani, until Dingani asks why she is in a coma. But as Vida is leaving, he hears Dingani blame himself for the situation. The focus now shifts to Marcus. He is dreaming about Jeannie, but is woken up by the phone. It is his mother from Belgium, and she tells him that Vida has told Dingani Jeannie is in a coma. She says that her and Dingani will handle this, that Marcus must not get involved. She said they will go home. Marcus considers what home means, as he always associated with Jeannie. He retrieves the copy of the atlas and turns to the page with the handprint. Esme, his wife, stirs, and he quickly hides it. Esme asks about the call, and he says it was his mother, but he doesn't tell her why she called. His father then calls and asks if he has told Crystal yet, and Marcus tells his father that if anything happens to Jeannie, that it will be his fault. Yet, his father is not surprised and ends the call. Marcus tries to phone Crystal, and leaves a voicemail saying she needs to get in touch with the family. Jeannie is in a coma, and he needs to go home. He needs to be with her. 
In America, Crystal is arriving home, ignoring Marcus's calls as she searches for her keys. She finds a California hatchling, which she moves out of harm's way using the postcard that Jeannie had sent. Now entering her apartment and putting her bag down, she decides to go back and check on the hatchling and finds that the mother had disappeared. She brings it inside before taking it to the vet the next morning, where she meets Xander Dangerfield. She leaves and listens to Marcus's voicemail. She feels as though Marcus is casting himself as the hero once again, and she feels that she is left to play the villain. The Masukas are a family that does not include Esme, Marcus's wife, and in this chapter she explains that. She explains how they have all decided to go home to be with Jeannie, but no one has asked her to join. She recalls her first meeting with Jeannie. Jeannie was driving her, Marcus and Crystal from the airport. She stopped the car to buy flame lilies to give to Esme. Esme finds out that she was adopted by the Masukus, but it didn't quite take, and she offers condolences for Jeannie's parents as she assumes that they have passed. Jeannie says that they did not die, but rather flew away. And it is in that moment that Esme then too believes that she loves Jeannie. Esme and Marcus have been married for 12 years and have three children. She was seduced by the beauty of the Masuku family and wanted to become a member. She soon realized that they were fragile. As she packs her husband's suitcase, she fears that she will lose him as he spends the day with her and the night with Jeannie, and if Jeannie ceased to exist, then he would never come back from the night, as it will be the only place in which he can find her, which is when he is dreaming. Marcus and Crystal meet at the airport. He is wearing a shirt picked up by Esme, and Crystal gives him a bunch of jacaranda flowers while commenting on the shirt. He is unaware that she is reading the slogan on the back of his shirt, We travel not to reach a destination, but to arrive with love, in love, to be with those we love. He says that this is rather appropriate for the occasion, and Crystal responds with poor Esme, as he didn't even realise what Esme means. She wants him to come back to her. Crystal also describes Esme and Marcus's relationship as codependent. The airplane is landing, and Marcus looks out of the window and thinks of how peaceful it looks despite the fact that it is the opposite. Crystal and Marcus collect their luggage before being greeted by the parents and grandmother. Eunice does not recognise Marcus. She says to him, They are plotting to overthrow the government, and then accuses Marcus of being one of them. They arrive back at the house. Something always develops or changes in this country, Crystal thinks. For example, the house itself has begun to deteriorate. Marcus is mad at his mother for cutting down the jacarandas and therefore does not speak to him. Crystal goes to her room, reciting lines from Lindsay Popper, a poem which Marcus recognises. Crystal's room is a monument to Jeannie's time with them. Eunice ripped the tape dividing the room after Jeannie had left, burned all of Jeannie's possessions and slapped Crystal for crying because she believed that Jeannie was a disappointment and not worth crying over. Crystal feels like she has to live with this absence, as they all leave the room except her. Vida is at the hospital looking at Jeannie. He observes that there are tubes everywhere. Jeannie's body is in distress. He can also feel her absence. She is not there. Vida feels defeated, but understands that the body is a threshold, and he knows what he must do next. This chapter is from Dr. Mombo's perspective. Dr. Mumbo recalls Jeannie as a defiant 16-year-old who made an appointment with her to discuss her HIV status. She came alone and asked how long she has to live, which Dr. Mumbo responded to with five years, because of the fact that antiretrovirals were not available at the time. Despite the many patients that she had encountered with HIV, she never anticipated Jeannie's response. Five years is long enough for me to do something good with my life. Dr. Mumbo witnessed both her defiance as she struggled with pneumonia, tuberculosis and meningitis, and that she has been true to her word. Her something good was that she found someone to love. 
Dr. Mumbo arrives at Jeannie's bed to see that she had disappeared. She cannot find a reason as to why Jeannie would have been moved. We are now with Valentine. The Masukus go to his office to report Jeannie as missing. Due to the Masukus' behaviour, he dislikes them, and because he likes following proper procedures, he makes sure to take his time with this case. The Masukus ask for help, and they ask for the missing person's form without waiting the 72-hour period. They blame Vida, but are unable to provide proof that he took her. Valentine says their request will be problematic, so they try to bribe him, and he refuses. His phone rings, and he leaves his office. He decides to make his way to the National Art Gallery, where he looks at the Firebird sculpture, which was made by Vida and could be about Jeannie. An old lady prevents him from touching it, so he rushes out the gallery and buys himself a new pair of sunglasses because he misplaced his old ones. Marcus enters the gallery, and Valentine follows him. The old lady scolds Marcus for touching the sculpture, but he says that he owns it, so she touches it too. She explains how she feels bad because she told Valentine, who she called the cripple man, not to touch it, and Valentine rushes out again. He remembers his first encounter with Jeannie, when he first started working at the organisation. A store was being shoplifted by teenage girls and wanted the organisation's help. They apprehended her, and she stripped before she was questioned. But she turned out to be innocent. She approached the mirror after she was dressed and said, You cannot break me. Valentine then realised who her parents are. Back at the office, he tells the Masukus that the case is difficult and shows them that Jeannie was recorded as dead in 1987 and then reported as kidnapped in 1988. So Marcus and Tandy decide to go see Manetle as she was the one who reported Jeannie dead. Mordecai enters the room with a very colourful bird that he is looking after, and Marcus recalls a similar bird at the Beaufort farming estate. They are, inf- they are informed the police have no news on Jeannie, but the Masukas think Vida put her in hospice. Mordecai says that they will help the Masukas. Tanti accuses Menenkle of declaring Jeannie dead without looking for her, and accuses both her and Mordecai of not taking Dingani's calls over flowers. Menenkle used to work as a florist at the shop Tandi bought, but Menenkle actually wanted to buy the shop. Tandi knew this but claimed that Menenkle could never afford it. Tandi tells Marcus that Menenkle and Mordecai believed Tandi and Dingani stole Jeannie and bribed the judge. The idea of Jeannie growing up with Menenkle and Mordecai without him makes him feel lonely. Menetle is now sitting in Valentine's office and tells him she reported her niece dead and would like to report her undead. The Masukas had misunderstood what Valentine had said. Menetle states that Vida is not behind Jeannie's disappearance and she's worried money has exchanged hands and that the Masukas will get their way. Valentine assures her that that is not the case here. He recognises that she is Golide's sister as she leaves and as she leaves, a colourful bird flies down onto her palm. Valentine and the chief superintendent at Hillside Police Station go to the Masuku's home. Valentine admires the colonial architecture, which he believes contrasts with the post-colonial monstrosities. Lawrence, the chief, envies how easily the Masukus have it, because they left the country at the right time and came back at the right time, when he works hard for nothing. Valentine lets the Masukas know he is in possession of the death certificate. He tells them a body was found at Beaufort and is claimed to be Imogen's, and the organisation will investigate. At breakfast, the Masukas get a call. Marcus answers and is greeted by a shriek of pain. It is Justina, telling Marcus that Valentine has contacted her and told her everything. Marcus confirms and she is distraught. After the call, Tandy says Justina's screaming was overdramatic, and she started questioning her right to grief. She wonders how Justina, the worker of her parents, survived, but not them. They all begin to acknowledge the grief process, and Dingani admits that he was responsible for what happened at the Beaufort Farm and Estate. This chapter now details Dingani's past. Dingani's mother was a prostitute in South Africa when she met Dingani's father. Ngani's father emotionally and physically abused him and his mother. He refused to support Dingani's mother, 
Because she could not study nursing or teaching, she was then forced to work as a housemaid and began to plot her revenge. She told Ingani to clean up one day and put on her, and she put on her best dress. They went to the house that she worked at and asked to speak to Emile Kutsia, who was visiting her madame's husband. She tells him that her husband and his friends are plotting to overthrow the government and in return she gets a reward. She gives their names and he is imprisoned. Eunice made a comfortable and respectable life for her and her son. Dingani met Tandi and they had a child. The child was then left with Tandi's parents and they went to America. This child was Marcus. Dingani returned to meet his political and radicalized friends when he was apolitical. In order to impress them, he told them he had met Golide and bragged about his aeroplane plans. The man himself questioned Dingani the next day and asked why Golide was building a plane. At first, he said he didn't know. Then he said to fly Elizabeth to Tennessee, but the man himself was not happy with those answers and kept prompting until Dingani lied and said that Golide plans to overthrow the government. Then Dingani receives news about what happened at Beaufort and he starts to receive monthly checks from the man himself. So guiltily, he deposits these checks into a trust for Jeannie until he has to use it to maintain the Masuku's family lifestyle through a collapsing economy.